We're so grateful to God. Thank you for joining us in this service this morning. If you have your Bible with me, you'll probably want to keep it open because I'm going to be all over this morning. But we'll start in James chapter 4 here in just a moment. Thank you to those that lead us in worship. Thank you if you're visiting with us once again. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. The staff and I, uh, several months ago, uh, in preparing for the year to come of 2020, that uh, we were preparing for the year and planning out the year and uh, in praying and trying to figure out what the Lord wanted for us, we decided that in the first three months of the year that we would take three different subjects or three different topics and that we would preach on that from the pulpit all the way through the church to the youth service. And so everyone throughout the month of January is preaching or teaching on prayer. And through January, you will hear about prayer. Into February, you will hear about family. And into March, we will start preaching on the five giants in your life. And you won't want to miss any of it. But uh, this morning, I want to start. I preached last Sunday morning, and you'll hear more later on in the next weeks to come about onward. And uh, so this morning, I want to start talking to you and tonight um, about prayer. And I believe that prayer is, is the most powerful thing that you can do for anybody. Um, you don't have enough money to get someone out of trouble. You don't have enough education to get someone out. It, it is only through prayer. And we'll hear about that. And uh, on Tuesday nights through this month, we have dedicated the hour from 6 to 7 on Tuesday nights here in the sanctuary to prayer. And we started that this past Tuesday night. And I'll just tell you, I've been the pastor of this church for four years and Tuesday night was probably one of the most powerful prayer meetings that, I've, that I have been a part of in the past four years. When you walked in the room Tuesday night, it was, it was the Lord met us here. He was already here. And, and that hour was, one of, was just a fantastic time. And the reason I believe that it was so is, one, it was a sacrifice. It's another time of the uh, week that you're coming out. We set that aside and we showed up. But um, uh, the other reason that I believe that, that was, it was so powerful is that the folks that showed up, that's what their intent was. They came for one reason, and that was to pray. And I'm telling you that it was very powerful. So this Tuesday night from 6 to 7, we'll do the same, we'll do the same again. Before I start this morning, um, last year, about this time, I was preaching, and I don't even remember what I was preaching on, but in the middle of the sermon, I felt the Lord's speak to me to say uh, about this time next year and and you'll be debt free and and so on and, and there was just a list of things and I'll tell you that 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 was a prophetic word but it has happened all year long for folks that folks have become debt free that miracles have happened jobs have happened healings have taken place and so what we're asking, because we continue to hear them now, people marked it on their calendars, they wrote it down, and things have happened all year long for them. So if you have a testimony about that, what God has done for you since this time last year till now, uh, we have a camera that will be set up in this room uh, just across, uh, when you go out these doors to the left, the last door on the left. And we want you to stop by Pastor Kobe. We'll be there this afternoon beginning at 5 o'clock to, um, to record your testimony. And then we're going to play those uh, for folks that, um, that just need some encouragement on what God's done in other people's lives. And we want to take a time to celebrate that. So James chapter 4 this morning, verses 2 through 3. I'll be there in just a second. But we're going to talk about prayer. And listen, this morning, talking about prayer... To this morning, tonight, and for the rest of the month, prayer is just simply a conversation with God. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, Pastor, how do I know when God's talking to me? Does he not just have one voice that he uses or one voice that he talks to? Well, I'll tell you, God talks to you like you talk. That's how you're going to recognize him. I don't believe, well, the Lord does not speak to me, speak to me in all the betwixt and be, be, bees with and all that kind of stuff. That's not how he talks to me. He talks like I talk. And, and so we're going to talk about the voice of God throughout uh, these times. So this morning, if I put a million dollars into your bank account, you are guaranteed a millionaire. I'll have a lot, everybody's attention now. 
if I put a million dollars into your bank account, you are guaranteed a millionaire. But if you don't know how to write a check, that which is guaranteed cannot be enjoyed. Too many of us who've got bank accounts full of God's blessings are forgetting to sign our checks. We forgot to draw from the spiritual reservoir or we forget to draw from the spiritual reservoir or we don't understand how to draw from that spiritual reservoir to live the successful Christian life. We either do not know how to sign the check we have forgotten to sign the check that taps into the blessing of God, or we just simply don't know how to tap into those blessings that God has for us. I want to say to you this morning that prayer is more than praying over my hot dog at the ball game. Prayer is more than, is more than, Lord, I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, which for a lot of people that would be a wonderful start. But prayer is more than that. I said to the prayer group on Tuesday night that prayer is actually warfare. That is why it is so difficult to do it and why it is so difficult to stay uh, on top of it because when you are a person of prayer, you are a person of warfare. And the enemy does not want you praying. In fact, the enemy does not want a praying church because prayer can change a church. Prayer can change a community. Prayer can change a marriage. Come on. Prayer and so James goes on to explain a little further in chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. Listen to what it says. The Bible says, you desire but do not have, so you kill. Or you desire but you do not have, so you take or you keep. You desire so you do not have, you do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Verse 3 says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. But you may spend, but that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Wow, James is pretty tough. He said again, you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask God, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. In other words, today we want, we covet, we desire what everybody else has. But we don't have that because we ask with the wrong motive. And so we don't, we don't have that in our lives because God knows that if we got what we wanted today, we would not use it for his glory or we would not return it to him, but that we would use it on ourselves. So therefore the Lord said you don't have because you ask amiss. I've learned over the years, and listen, let's just talk for a moment. I've wanted all the great things, big fancy cars, a big bank account, all of those things, just like everybody else. When I was in college, I thought, man, I can't wait to get out so I can get me a big house, white picket fence, and all of those things and have absolutely no worries in my life. Well, if the Lord answered some of those prayers for us today, he knows that we would have never given him glory because we're asking for wrong motives because he knew that if he gave us what we asked for, we would use it for our own pleasure. The Bible said every good gift comes from the Father above. Not everybody is a millionaire. Not everybody is rich. Not everybody has what everybody else has because God knows if he gave you that, it would be that which takes, which takes you away from him. So when I've learned over the years that he's first, when I've learned over the years that everything I have is because of him, my life included, that if he didn't desire for me to have what I have, I would not have that, so therefore, I want him to be number one in everything I've got. And I want to honor God with everything 
I have. And so therefore, my family and I, we do. Jesus said, well, let me go back for just a moment. Many of us, prayer is like the national anthem at a football game. It gets us started, but simply has no connection with what's happening on the field. It is simply a courtesy. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13 said, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. Let me go back to say it again. These people, he's not talking about the folks that are lost and out in the world. He's talking about the church. He said, these people, they come near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips. In other words, they tell a good story. They talk a good story and they look a good story, but their lips, their hearts, I'm sorry, but their hearts are far from me. Listen, a lot of the condition of the church today, whether it's our church or any other church, a lot of the condition of the church today is because we have, we have not a money problem, but we have a heart problem. It is not that we have a money issue in the world today. It is that we have a disobedience problem in the church today. It, and so Isaiah said, these people, let me say it again, come near to me. They come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. In other words, that is religion. And I said yesterday, on, I just posted, I don't do a whole lot of that, but on Facebook yesterday as I was studying for this, I said yesterday, be careful, be careful about religion and don't miss Christ. You can, you can be religious today and completely miss the relationship with Jesus Christ. You can sit on the church pews of this church today and completely miss Christ. You can come here today... Their worship is of me, of me, I'm sorry, the scripture said, this is the Lord speaking to Isaiah, is based merely off of human rules that they've been taught. That's religion. And religion is like walking on a treadmill. You look like you're doing all the right things. You look good and you're doing all the right things, but you are going nowhere. Jesus said nearly the same thing in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8 through 9. In his words, he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So today I want to talk to you about prayer for a little while. And there's no way, there's no way you could ever, I could never finish a sermon on prayer. But we'll start today. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, the Bible said, Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought to always pray and not lose heart. Brother Brankel said yesterday, and it was said of him many times in the celebration for his birthday yesterday, that he has he is a man of prayer. I know that to be true because the times I've called him, the times I've gone over to visit him, the times in the service, and I can look back there at times to see him, he is a man of prayer that is always in prayer. The scripture said that men ought to always pray and not lose heart. In Matthew chapter 7, let me give you a few scriptures here for a minute. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 8, Jesus said again himself, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. I found three things in that right there that the scripture said that we are to do. We are to ask, we are to seek, and we are to knock. But most of the time what we find ourselves doing is all just simply asking. What about the seeking? 
What about the seeking of God? What happened, what happened to prayer times? I remember when I was a kid at Malvern First Assembly that they didn't come down just for a little visit with Jesus. Those folks came down until there was a breakthrough. Come on, somebody. Anybody remember those days when everybody wasn't worried about the Baptist beating them to the buffet at lunch? They wasn't worried about what everybody thought of them at the altar. They weren't worried about if there were some tears that streamed down their face. But let me tell you, tell you in this past year I've seen that happen around these altars and I praise God we attend a church today that is not afraid through the power of prayer to pray until something happens it's not about what you do it's about what he's done for you but Lord, I said a little prayer this morning. But Lord, I've done this. Lord, I've done that. Lord, I've, it's not about what you've done. It's about the fact that he was drugged to Golgotha's hill that day. And he holds all the power today. I said he holds the keys of death and hell and the power of God. And the way you tap into that is through. Am I in a Pentecostal church today? Am I in the right church or did I stumble into another one this morning? We are Pentecostal today. We believe in the power of prayer. I don't have to have a man go for me. I can walk right into the throne room of God today in the power of the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you today that we can push back every bit of darkness in our lives if you would simply take time to pray. Our prayers normally wind up something like this. Lord, you know I need money today. You know I need money by Friday. Lord, you know I need money. You know I need, you know I need, you know I need, you know I need, you know I need. You know I need. Or they wind up something like this. Lord, move them, move them, move them, move them. Lord, get that pastor out of here. Get that pastor out of here. Get that pastor out of here. Lord, hurry up. Hurry. Those are, I don't want to do this. I don't like that. Those are normally what our prayers wind up being. It's not about what we've done for him or what we've done. It's about what he did for us. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You shall receive power after yet that the Holy Ghost. Where's the power in the church today? You shall receive power after yet that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I said we're Pentecostal people. We believe in the moving of the Holy Ghost. Or have we become ashamed of it over all these years? Where I'm telling you today that I'm not ashamed to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of speaking in other tongues uh, with the power that we are able. Listen, you better... I said, I'm unashamed of it today. I tell you that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. God's looking today for a group of people that will stand up in these last days and are unashamedly followers of Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you give the Lord? Well, I'm sorry, Pastor. I may lose my job. I'm sorry, Pastor. I may lose some of my friends. Listen, you don't have very many friends to begin with, and God will give you another job in these last days. I'm I'm concerned about is your name written in the Lamb's book of life because those eastern clouds are, are just about to split open. Are you ready to go? Most of us can't make up our minds if we're ready to go. When we start talking about going, we don't want to hear about it anymore. We don't want to hear about it because we've not, ooh, almost, whoa, we've not done a lot of the things we want to do yet, we've not gotten, we're not ready, we're not ready. You know you're not ready. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20, the Bible said, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Verse 9 said, and for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Listen, what we need today is somebody to get filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues uh, and to stand boldly for Jesus Christ today. They're not afraid to stand for Islam. They're not afraid to stand uh, for other religions today. I want to know do we have a group of people that would stand boldly for Jesus Christ today and say, I am unashamedly a follower of Jesus Christ? I was
was going to read this to you in just a moment. It fit better later, but I think it fits better here. Someone handed me an article this past week, which was a, a reporter interviewing a very high, pro, high profile preacher in our time. And they were asking him questions. And here is one of the questions to those of you that may not be able to get excited today about Jesus. Here is what he said. Here's the question. In general, churches seem to be less evangelistic than they used to be. What are the consequences of that in today's time? That's the question. Here is the pastor's answer. People, he said, usually do not, I'm sorry, usually do not believe the gospel until they have met a Christian who has integrity, who loves them, who knows what he or she believes and is willing to stand for the truth. He said, I was reading the other day where the Apostle Paul said, we are a letter known and read by all men. The pastor goes on to say, we can complain all we want about our culture and where it is going. But until we, can st until we have people who can stand at the dinner table or wherever they may be and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that are lost, the church is going nowhere today. He said, we can still have a meeting in our home with our friends and neighbors and represent Christ to them. Are we going to use the opportunities that we still have to evangelize, the pastor said? One study, he goes on to say, found the reason that Christians don't evangelize or the reasons that Christians today do not stand up is because of the unconquered sin in their own life. He said their sin convicts them and their conscience says to them, how can you recommend Jesus to someone who has not delivered you from your sins as of yet? So he there goes on to say, so that's really the issue that has to be confronted in the church today. Listen, if the church is ever going to evangelize and we're going to reach the lost, we must deal with the sins in our own lives. Come on, somebody. If we're going to grow the church, if you're going to reach your granddaughter, if you're going to reach your family, this is good preaching. We must deal with the sin. Judgment starts in the house of God. If we're going to grow the church, we got to... It's the answer. The reason we don't get excited is because we know there's sin in our own lives. There's things I've got to do. The reason I can't cross the door, the reason I can't go next door to talk to my neighbor is that my neighbors heard me cussing in my own backyard. The reason I can't go talk to so-and-so is they caught me last week out of town drinking in the restaurant. How can you be a... Listen, well... How can we ever expect the Lord to fill the church and to tell, listen, we just took the tithes and offerings a few minutes ago. Hey, your name's Robert? Yeah, I'd love for you to come visit our church. Won't you come? We got a great church. We have the best church in town. All the rest of them think they are, but we really are. <laughs> Sorry, Robert, I'm biased, but I would really love for you to come visit our church. Robert comes to visit our church, gets saved, or he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And I start teaching and talking and talking and talking. They take the offering. And Robert's telling them about tithing, and they'll turn around and say, but I didn't see you. I didn't see you give, and you're telling me to give. The reason that we can't, the pastor there is saying that we don't evangelize it's because we have sin in the camp. Strong. We've got to deal with it in our own lives. Ephesians said, give the enemy no place. It give the enemy no place. That means I'm not to hide. I'm not to try to hide those things in my life. Well, let's just go here for a second. Pastor, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm willing to give up smoking. I'm willing to give up addiction. I'm, you know, I'm willing to give up some of those things. But you know, my soap operas, I just can't do that. Man, and, you know, it's not my fault that I wind up gossiping. I just can't help myself. I called them for a prayer request. <laughs> Pastor, I just couldn't help myself. I just can't. They just come to me. Ooh. There's a reason they come to you. 
like draws like. Come on, this is tough for a second. Ephesians said, give the enemy no place, but we take that which we are, don't want to deal with and we hide it somewhere in our lives. Pastor, I'll give you this, or Lord, I'll give you this, Lord, I'll give you that. But that, you know what, I mean, I just ain't ready. I can't give that up. That is the thing that is keeping you from moving forward. That is the thing that's keeping, Ephesians said, give the enemy no place. Listen, when you come to God, you can't pick and choose what you want to give to him and what you don't want to give to him. He is either Lord of your life or he's not Lord at all. Come on, somebody. He's either Lord over this church or he's not Lord at all. He's over, either Lord over all of my marriage, over my money, over all of my decisions, or he's not God at all. Man, Pastor, are you mad? No, I'm not mad. I'm passionate. Because we have so many people that are walking around on the treadmill. Prayer is a subject that transcends all religious barriers. Every religion has their own idea of prayer and of the proper means and times and reasons for it. Various religions pray to a diversity of gods. The thing that sets the prayers of the Christian apart from all others is that other religions pray to dead deities. I said the thing that sets us apart from all other beliefs and all other religions is that today they are praying to a dead deity. We as a believer are praying to the God who is very much alive today. I'm not talking to you about a statue. I'm not talking to you about a piece of jewelry. I'm not talking to you about some kind of animal. I'm talking to you about a God that on the third day they thought they had him. He didn't have to have that too. He was just borrowing it for a short period of time. And on that third day, he rose and he's still alive. And he's still in control today. Malachi said, I am the Lord and I change not. In other words, what he's saying, your opinion, your attitude, your thoughts, your treadmill does not matter because I am God and I do not change. I cannot change God's thoughts with my attitudes, what I think's right and what I think's wrong. He said, I am the Lord and I change not. He's not going to put off his return because you say you're not ready. He's not, he's not delaying his return till you get done having fun. He's not delaying his return until you decide to be obedient. He said, I'm the Lord. Are y'all listening? And I change not. Peter Kreft said, I strongly suspect that if we saw all the differences even in the tiniest of our prayers that they make. And all the people, all the people those little prayers were destined to affect, and all the consequences those prayers down through the centuries, we would be so paralyzed with awe at the power of prayer that we would be unable to get up off our knees for the rest of our lives. The Word of God makes it clear that prayer is an act of communicating with God. It's just a simple act of communication. It's a conversation with God. Some conversations, some prayers I've been having with God for years. Some things he and I have been talking about for years. Some things I keep on talking about when he may be done with, but it's just simply at the very least, it's a conversation with God. How many conversations do we have? But listen, prayer is not just simply me doing all the talking. At some point, I got to do some listening. 
I got to do some listening somewhere along the way. And we as Pentecostals, we are good at emotion. We are, we are good at, 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 at hype and preaching and all of those things. But that's not what it's all about. Sometimes Pentecostal being f- filled with the power of the Holy Ghost is just sitting in his presence while he does some talking to you. The reason that we don't like that is because we may be afraid of what he's going to say. We could be afraid of what he's going to say. It's somewhat surprising that in a book made up of divine wisdom, applied to the earthly conditions of the people of God, we have only a few references of prayer. The book of Proverbs contains no recorded prayers. However, Proverbs does acknowledge the following. And you understand that Proverbs is a book of wisdom, but we find no actual recorded prayers. But Proverbs does mention this. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says that prayer is the acknowledgement of God as the director of our path. In Proverbs chapter 4, he says, the writer says that prayer is the channel through which divine wisdom becomes ours. In Proverbs chapter 3, prayer is the guarantee of inward peace and outward prosperity. In Proverbs chapter 15, prayer is a delight to God and is beneficial when it is offered by our righteous lips. In Proverbs chapter 28, prayer when uttered by unholy lips is an abomination to God. And prayer in Proverbs chapter 28 is a confession for discovered sin who results in acceptance of divine mercy. Let me tell you the way today that you have freedom, the way today that you have pure joy is that you have a conversation with God Almighty and you recognize that you are a sinner and he is a savior and that he can set you free and then you will have the joy you've always looked for. Can you say amen to that? No marriage counselor can give you that. No lawyer can give you that. No banker can give you that. It's only through a conversation with the creator of heaven and earth that I find peace in a world. Man, my God. Only through a conversation with God. I'm a sinner, Lord, please forgive me. That's where you start. Some of you in this room, if we were to roll back the spiritual curtain, you've got a mess and you've made a mess. And you're still making a mess. You showed up just like he said, the the Lord said in Isaiah, you look like you have it all together. Everybody thinks you have it all together. You've been here for years and years and they think you're okay. But if we were to take a look into your life, I didn't mean to do this today. I didn't feel like it when I walked up here, I promise. Let's look at Let's talk about it. Whew. I have a preacher, a pastor friend that came from a long distance away several years ago, struggling, having all kind of difficulties in his life. He said, I can feel like I can trust you and I can trust you to help me. And I've got to pour my heart out to somebody, and he did. And he was struggling. After two or three days of me spending time with him through prayer. I'll tell you, so many people have a problem with deliverance and the word about deliverance. Let me just tell you in a nutshell what deliverance is. It's an old-fashioned prayer meeting of praying somebody through. That's what deliverance is. We spent three days of praying that guy through. And I'm telling you, he got the victory. He's got it today. And his church has just taken off because that guy got the victory. Who is it, Pastor? I'll die and go to my grave without ever telling it. But every once in a while, he'll call me and just jokingly, and he'll say, you still are saved today, aren't you? He's doing it jokingly, maybe, partially. But what he's doing is to make sure that I keep what I told 
And I've said back to him at times, sir, it's not me. It's God. I want you to know today, listen, and I'm telling, I'm talking to somebody. You've been here for years or you just got here. You on the treadmill, you look, you have snowed everybody else. But listen to what I'm telling you. You have not snowed God. We may think we've gotten by with it to this point. I'm going back to this because it's just obedience, the principle of God. Folks have been on the church pew for years and never give a dime. we got teenagers that give more than some adults has been for 50 years. The Bible said in Malachi, you are cursed with a curse. The Bible, that is God speaking, cursed with a curse. That word curse in Malachi means punishment. You are under a punishment from God. Well, he hadn't got me yet. Oh, yeah, well, we've lost family members before it's time. We've lost jobs before it was time. We've lost all kinds of other things before it was time because we are, this is good preaching, that we are under a curse from God. It is the only place in the Bible that you can find that if you'll fall into immediate obedience that the curse of God will lift. I pray today that a spirit of obedience would fall upon the church once again, not just for your money, but I'm talking about in prayer. I'm talking about in your marriage. I'm talking about in healing. I'm talking about in deliverance where we in these last days will see an incredible move of God because of obedience. It's the answer. Thank you, Pastor Gary. Y'all got time for point number one? That's where we're at. Number one. Prayer is required to be forgiven. Not just once, but continually. Not continually with him, but continually for things in our lives we'll talk about here in just a moment. Listen to what the writer said in Psalm chapter 32, verse 1 through 6. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in those spirit who there is no deceit. Verse three, the writer said, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. David said, when I closed my mouth and there was no confession and I was not in conversation with you, my bones grew weak because I was hiding those things from you. Verse four says, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into drought of summer. Verse five said, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin for the cause of everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come. Listen, church, today it's, it's old fashioned. It's out of date. And there's a whole lot of churches around today that's not saying one word about it. And that's sin. Don't tell me, sir, about my wrongdoing. This is my life. Don't tell me there's something wrong with what I'm doing as to what I feel like doing. Don't tell me you're twice as young as I am. And you're telling me that today, the writer said in Psalms 32, when I kept my mouth closed, he said, I was rotting away on the inside. Why? Because what's living on the inside is slowly destroying you. I've never killed anybody. I've never, I've never cheated on my wife. I've never cheated on my husband. I, I don't beat my kids. Great. But it's more than that. What about all the anger we have in the church today? What about all the unforgiveness we have towards each other? We're doing real estate a wonderful 
justice or wonderful service in this town for the building and leasing of churches. Some of the main reason is because we can't get along. We don't agree. In fact, and what we're not agreeing with is the will of God. I'm, I'm, what about unforgiveness on the pew? Grudges, bitterness. Pastor, this is tough. I, I need to find me somewhere else to go. Well, I pray wherever you go, that, that they'll tell you the very same thing. Church, this is the answer. It's about dealing with the disobedience and the sin in our lives today. I'm not here today. Listen, I'm not here today to take this microphone and beat you over the head. I'm not here today to be your judge. That's not, I got, hey, listen, I got my own set of problems to deal with. If you had to look at this in the mirror every day and have to deal with this every day, I got a whole lot of stuff to deal with on my own. I'm not here to browbeat you. I'm not here today to judge you, but I am here to tell you what the truth is. Because the truth is what's going to set you free. The truth is what will make you free. Please allow me to paraphrase the first and second verse to say this. Happy and fortunate to be envied is the person whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, toward whom the Lord does not keep a record of wrongs committed, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Did you hear what I just said? To where there is a Lord that does not keep records of wrongdoing committed. Listen, sir or ma'am. We breeze in out of church every once in a while and we think it's because we, we, there's no commitment, there's no faithfulness because we think God's sitting there with his book that has my name on the front page and he's keeping a record of everything that's done wrong. Listen, if you've asked for forgiveness and your name's written in the Lamb's book of life, those sins are cast in the sea of God's forgetfulness never to be remembered. And what we need to do is cut ourselves loose from the old man. What we need to do is have a spiritual funeral in the church and we need to stop dragging around the old dead man because God's got a happiness. He's got a joy. He's got a future. And you can have more than you've ever had in your life. That is what I'm trying to convey to you today. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not trying to just take up an hour or two of your life. I'm not just up here because of the pay. I've done it for free. I'm not up here. I'm not up here because I'm the pastor of this church just because. I'm up here because I love you. And I am up here because I'm a walking testimony. Because I know what I was. I said, I know what I was. And I know what he made me. That's what I'm trying to tell you today. Stop walking on the treadmill. The process of forgiveness in the scripture that I just read to you looks like this. In Psalm chapter 32, it looks like this. First, there was acknowledgement in verse 5. He said, I, the writer said, I acknowledge my sin to you. I recognize, the writer said, I'm wrong. You know that my grandmother, my mother's mother, was in an assembly of God, the first assembly of God church ever in Malvern, Arkansas, and her mother, which would be my great-grandmother, was one of the charter members of that church. There were 19 of them. So my great-grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, and then on to us. They were praying people. My, my grandmother sat over here on the right with a lot of other grandmothers. That was the granny spot, I guess. And I'm telling you, on Sunday mornings when, they, when I was a kid and they would get to going, you know what I'm talking about. Those grannies would file out of that pew over there. And I'm telling you, they'd come down to that altar and they, pray, they, they, they prayed louder than the folks were singing. <laughs> they didn't care if the mayor was in the church. They didn't care if the next door neighbor was in the church. They came, they came to do business with God. I'm telling you, they'd dance all over everywhere. Sister Goldman was one of the ladies, and 
Sister Goldman had snow white hair. She had a bun on top of her head all the time. Had a, always wore a skirt come down to her ankles. Sister Goldman, she stepped out of that pew one day, one Sunday morning. I remember it, I remember it to today when I was a kid sitting in the youth group. She stepped out and she come across the front of that during one of the songs. And she just kind of picked up her skirt just a little bit. She started dancing around. And it was just like as she went across that front of that altar, she was just slinging something out on everybody she walked by. And I'm telling you, the glory of God filled that house that day that I remember from when I was a teenager. Where are those days today? What is the next generation gonna see that we are trying to raise? But I did not get here just certainly on the prayers of my grandma. I'm individually responsible for it and you are individually responsible for yours today. I have to acknowledge it. I'm not right today just because my grandmother was right. I'm not right today just because my daddy put the last nail over there in that wall. I'm not right because of that. I'm right because I acknowledge my wrongdoing. The second thing you see there is the confession, verse 5. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. In other words, I'm going to tell him. Why do I have to tell him? He already knows. Exactly right. He already knows. But there is something about the power of confession. It is giving the enemy no place anymore in your life. The third thing you see there is forgiveness. In verse 5, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. How did we get to forgiveness? We first acknowledged that we were wrong, and second, we confessed that we were a sinner. Then it came. There's no, listen to me, listen to me today. This just came. It's not on my notes or nothing. There are no, everybody say no. There are no shortcuts to God. There are no short, I don't care how old you are, I don't care how long you've been around, I don't care if you just got here today, there are no shortcuts to heaven. There are no shortcuts to God. You cannot skip a part of the process just because you don't think you're process worthy. You cannot skip over just because you think you've gotten by with it. There are no shortcuts to God. Man, that's good. Write that down, would you? Let me find a place to stop here on point number one. The psalmist in the scripture states that as long as he kept silent, he grew increasingly miserable. Go back and read Psalms 32. Some of you, you're ready to go. Already checked out. Already gone, Sister Sandy. Already checked out of this service. And God brought you here today to talk to you about these three things. Acknowledgement, confession, forgiveness. The psalmist said, as long as I kept quiet, that he grew increasingly miserable. You know why? I believe because he was so convicted already. It was because conviction was at work in his life. And he didn't want to talk about it. He wants to talk about everybody else's wrongdoing. He wants to talk about what everybody else ought to be doing, what everybody else is not doing. He wants to talk about what the preacher ought to be preaching and what the crowd, what the, what the, what the choir ought to be singing. We have wasted so much time on music wars, it's ridiculous. We've wasted so much time on what we think to be right. Lord, turn, turn them into a pile of ashes. <clears throat> Lord, you go get them, get them, get them. Go get them. I believe the writer, the reason in the beginning of chapter 32 he couldn't talk is because he was so convicted. <clears throat> the enemy is very good at causing us 
to continue to conceal those things. That preacher, he's not talking about you. You made it through this week. He's not talking to you. He, that, that scripture, it's not for you. It's not for you. Your family's been in this church. All, I have great many friends. It's, it's not talking to you. He's talking to them. I don't know. I'll never match what Brother Brankel has done in my life, in my lifetime. 75 years of preaching and preaching around the world. That was when folks would come to church for a revival for like three weeks in a row. Now, it's very difficult to keep them three hours in a row. Somebody asked me just this week, Pastor, how come there's not more revivals at the church? The answer is very, very simple, because folks won't come. The answer is very simple. Oh, but let Iran. Let us see another 5,000 people killed in New York. Let us see the doctor tell you a terminal diagnosis. Let us see a financial reversal. Let us see. I want you to notice what he states in the end as to what the end result was in verse 6. For this cause, anyone who is godly shall pray. And in a time when you may be found, why did he say that? Because there's coming a time that he will not, you will not be able to find him. Now is the time. Let me ask you a question this morning, sir. Let me ask you a question this morning, ma'am. How much longer are you going to put God off? How much longer? I know, and listen, this gets better as we go along in the other points. How much longer are you, are we, is the church going to continue walking on the treadmill? People today don't want to know necessarily that we look like we have it together. They want to know that we have it together. How much longer are you going to keep walking on the treadmill? How much longer are you going to keep your marriage on the treadmill? How much longer are you going to keep your prayer life on the treadmill? The end result, he said, was... That for this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when he may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near to him. We should pray continually to be sure that we're not harboring unconfessed sin. And let, I know, I know this is going to happen it's going to happen with people watching, potentially. It's going to happen in this church right now, today. It's going to happen in churches all around the world today that folks may, I hope, hear a message about this and hear a message about sin in their lives, and guess what they're going to do? Those that it fell on fertile soil, they'll make a change before they get in their car. But those that came only to hear will walk right out the door the very same way they came in the door Lord please don't let that be the case oh but pastor if they see me down there at that altar they'll think something's wrong we already know something's wrong well pastor if they see me they see me you know I've been around for so long and they see me they're going to think they're going to think you know somewhere along the way I've made a mistake guess what every single one of us have made mistakes Every single one of us have made mistakes. I'll read the second part of this article to you tonight. 
powerful what this guy says about prayer. I'm going to stop here today. And I wrote this down before I walked out here. Joni came in my office just before we started and we prayed together. When she walked out, I turned around and I just wrote down right here in red ink. I put it in a box right here down the corner. And I just simply wrote, stop putting it off. Stop putting it off. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. In fact, you're not even guaranteed this afternoon. Pastor, are you trying to scare me? If that's what it takes, then yes. But what I am most importantly telling you is it's the Word of God. Stop putting it off. There are folks sitting here that you just got here today. There's folks you've been sitting here for a long time. How much longer are you going to continue to put off disobedience? Or obedience? How much longer are we going to continue to pick and choose what we want to live and what we don't want to live? Lord, I want your healing, but I'm not giving anything back. Lord, I want your salvation, but I'm not serving for nothing. I mean, you know. Lord, I want your salvation. I want to go to heaven and I want to hear great music, but I'm not not available. How much longer? And I've reminded the church of this over and over. And I'm closing right here to say to you, go home today and read Matthew 24, 25. Wars and rumors of wars, storms. All of the things the book said over 2,000 years ago, it's not just in Matthew. It's from, genera- from Genesis to Revelation. It's all in the book. How much longer are you going to keep putting it off? Lord, I know this morning it feels, it's a very solemn moment, Lord, but I feel, I feel your presence in the room. I pray there's conviction in the room today. God, you knew exactly who would be here this morning. You knew exactly who would be watching this morning. You knew exactly what you once wanted said this morning, I pray, Lord, that I have said what you wanted me to say. Now, Holy Spirit, it's your your time. You go and convict and do only what you can do. thought of this as your head's bowed I've thought of this over the past few days we're facing an enemy in our world today that finds honor in death you cannot stop an enemy that finds honor in death they're not afraid to blow themselves up they're not afraid to blow anybody else up because to die is honor to them. The only thing that can change their heart is the Holy Spirit. I was reading in Malachi where the Lord called his people thieves. And I thought about that. There's rich thieves and there's poor thieves. There's all kind of thieves. The only person that can change a thief's heart is the Holy Ghost. And the only person that can change a person that lives with sin is the Holy Ghost. That's who you need today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody's looking around. You just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, today I'm ready to get off the treadmill. I want to live. I'm ready to live the life God has called me to live. If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up right where you are right now, unashamedly. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Somebody else. I'm, I want to unashamedly today 
I'm <clears throat> getting off the treadmill. Come on, lift your hand this morning. Raise your hand this morning. This is your moment. Don't give the enemy another second in your life this morning. You'd say, Pastor, today I want to make sure that I'm right with God. I want to live my life for Jesus Christ. If that's you, slip your hand up right where you're at. Come on, don't wait. One. Thank you, sir. Somebody else. If you lifted your hand, I want you to come. Pastor Cody's coming. Brother Daniel, some other guys are coming. I need some ladies to come. If you lifted your hand, I want you to stand and come right now. Don't wait one second. There's going to be somebody standing here to pray for you. Come on, if you raised your hand, I want you to come. Christy. Come on, here comes two. Somebody else. You'd say, this morning, I'm getting off the treadmill today, Pastor, and I want to live my life like God wants me to live. Come on. Thank God for these two that have come this morning. There's not another greater miracle if somebody was rolled in here with no feet in a wheelchair and they got up and ran out of this place. That would not be as great a miracle as what's taking place right there in front of you right now when souls give their life to Jesus Christ. It's the greatest miracle. You want to see one? Open your eyes and look. There's two miracles taking place right in front of you. Here's the second part of this. And if you need to go, you're free to go. Thank you for coming. I hope you'll come back tonight. Prayer meetings at 515, service at 6. I promise we'll have church. But I want to open this altar right now to those that have a desire to pray and would come and find yourself a place around this altar. And maybe you have unconfessed sin in your life. Maybe you've got unforgiveness. Maybe you've got bitterness. Maybe, you, and you're, maybe this morning you're living in disobedience. You're not in obedience with God. I want to open this altar. I want you to come right now. Okay, let's make this easier. Would you please stand? Because I'm telling you, this altar ought to be crammed full of people about unconfessed sin and difficulties in their life. What other opportunity are we waiting on? What other opportunity are we waiting on? Are we waiting for 5,000 more people to be killed? Are we waiting for some other kind of crisis before we start a life of prayer? Are we waiting for some other kind of bad report from the doctor before we'll come to an altar and give God thanks for what he's done? Come on, church, would you cry out to God this morning as they lead us?